Welcome, everyone. Uh, how many of you are excited to discuss about mainframe systems today? <laughs> but what? I'm glad. But yeah, nothing to panic. I'm not going to talk anything about mainframe systems. What we are going to discuss about today is how we did the migration of one of the department's workloads towards AKS. And we are just going to walk through the fun-filled journey that we had towards migrating all those work th workloads into AKS. So I hope you enjoy it. This is going to be our agenda for today. Uh, one of my colleagues named Nero had to join me today, but unfortunately he couldn't join because of personal reasons. So I do have Soumya with me joining today. Oh yeah, that's me with a nice smiley face. So if you want to get in touch with me after this session, that's my LinkedIn profile name. And you, you, you can just search me there in LinkedIn. And if you want to connect after the session, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. So what I basically do, I like to solve all the problems that organizations face. I at least try my best to solve all the problems. Sometimes we do fail, sometimes you always succeed. So. I am basically a developer come turned cloud native architect. So I did join uh, one of the organizations 13 years back as a Java development engineer. And over a period of time, I tried my hands around all different stacks. So I did turn into a full stack engineer and I did try my hands around front end. And then I thought, OK, now it's time for cloud, right? So I did start my journey towards cloud native very recently. And I'm very specialized towards architecting designs which are more focused towards performance optimization and also aligning things with business objectives. That's what I'm more specialized towards. I think it's enough about me, right? Let's get into the topic. OK, do we have any non-technical people here in the room? No? OK. I think you will not enjoy this slide then. So basically, what happened when uh, I joined ABN Amro, there was one of the product owners who did try to contact me and say, hey, Raji, I have a problem. And I want you to solve it using containers and Kubernetes. I was like, OK. <laughs> Can you explain a bit more about your problem? Can you explain a bit more about your workload? He was like, yeah, we do have one workload. I was like, OK, interesting. And what's your platform? what does your platform look like? And he just said, I have two virtual machines. And I have one workload running on it. And I want to go to Kubernetes with it. I was like, OK. I was still patient enough. And I wanted to really know why. He was like, yeah, everybody in the organization is talking about Kubernetes, and everyone outside the organization is also talking about Kubernetes. So it's very fancy, so I want to move to there. OK, but there should really be a problem which you want to solve, right? So then he said, yeah, I do have all my engineers working on incidents saying, my application is going down always. I was like, OK, give me some time to talk to your engineers. Let me see what is the real problem. So we did had a couple of sessions, and we did do a root cause analysis. And the decision was there was a memory leak in their application, and all that they had to do was fix their code. So, <laughs> so it was a really funny uh, discussion that I had with all the engineers. And they were like, yeah, we want to go to Kubernetes. We want to go to Kubernetes. But I think every one of us, at least in the architecture field, when you're talking to non-technical people, you're going to face this one. And we also have the challenge of explaining them that, do you really need Kubernetes? If as yes, then what are the problems we are going to solve? Right? So this was the funny part about choosing Kubernetes. And this is the next one. right? So when Kubernetes came into picture, all, at least most of the engineers were like, Hey, I want to learn Kubernetes. It's so new in the market. <laughs> I'm going to start learning it, right? So the moment they start learning it, they just see the first few things, right? Yeah, health checks, scheduling, service decoding, wonderful. 
let me start deploying my first application in Kubernetes. And once they deep dive into it, they're like, okay, config maps, services, callback, whatnot. And I'm like, okay, where am I now? <laughs> Right, so this is the feeling we exactly had in the teams that we were going to help with the migration as well because there were hardly one or two engineers who had Kubernetes knowledge. So how do you resolve this kind of challenges when you are starting the migration towards Kubernetes? That's something my colleague Soumya is going to explain you in the second half of the session. But yeah, I, I, I still believe that this is going to be one of the major challenges when it comes to Kubernetes. Not everybody is an expert like us in Kubernetes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, statistics of the old stack that we had before we finished our migration. So we did have 50 plus, yeah, it was even more than that, virtual missions, which had all different kind of workloads, all different kinds of traffics, HTTP, TCP, UDP, all kinds and all the load balancers that had to balance the load. And for people who already knew Azure, you do have function apps, which is serverless pass servers from Azure. And there's also logic apps, which is kind of low code automation, pass service again provided by Azure. And for all the pipelines that we had to deploy all this infrastructure and applications, we did use bicep templates. So moving on to uh, the VM-based workloads, how did we have it? This is a very high level design diagram. I'm not deep diving into express routes or all other stuffs. So if you can see the diagram here, it's, it's really a very nice picture, right? We did have this clusters which we used to manage by ourselves. You have cluster one, two, three, four, and people managing all these clusters with all the pipelines, patching pipelines, management pipelines, and stuff like that. So this was the VM-based workloads that we had, and every time there was a requirement to onboard a new workload, you start creating a new cluster. Coming to the problems that we wanted to solve, especially for VM-based workloads, of course we are paying money for all the VMs that we use, so do you really utilize all the resources of the VM that we are currently running in production? The answer was no. So that's one of the main problems that we wanted to solve. And the next one was running an environment in a few minutes. In today's world, you want things to run immediately in production or at least within a few minutes, right? You are not going to wait for an hour or two just to get into production. So that's another challenge that we wanted to fix and also the time to project production. So any VM that we had to create, you had to set up the network, you had to set up the configurations, you had to make sure that the pipelines run smooth in each and every VM that we had. So that was taking, let's say for adding a VM, I could say an hour or two to get into production. Scalability, yeah, it, it was a really funny thing. So. When we are running in production and there is a spike in traffic, you get an alert saying, hey, your load balancer is going down. So then someone in the team starts shouting, okay, you have to increase the VM count now. So then you go and manually increase your VM count configs, run the pipelines, and then wait until the VM is up and running to load balance your new traffic, right? And there, there is also the funny discussion that you have, okay, I'm managing five to six clusters, so where do I add my new VM, right? So that was also always a funny discussion between the engineers. And next was the mismanagement of configs. So I'm going to explain one incident which happened. There was a production incident where we had to increase the queue size and someone just logged into one of the production VMs, changed the queue size. Everything went fine, incident was resolved. And after a week, the incident was back again. So we did had a root cause analysis call. We noticed that hey, this was fixed already, and why do we have it again? So the reason was someone logged into the production machine, changed it there, and another person ran the pipeline, and all the configs were overwritten. 
right? So that's where we notice that, okay, providing access, you cannot block that for engineers always. You always get the root access to the VMs and they just keep playing around in it in the production environment. So that's one of the problems we wanted to solve. And the maintenance nightmare, I think that's something all of us as Kubernetes already know, uh, Kubernetes engineers already know that what are the pains that you have on maintaining a VM. Let it be a patching, let it be your version upgrades, let it be your networking and stuff like that. As I mentioned, we also had serverless workloads. So for the serverless workloads, one of the main issue that we noticed is there were always 2% of failure rate for the serverless workloads that we were running on. Major reason being we don't have any control over the infrastructure, it's managed service, and we don't have enough insights to really look into it and see, hey, what's going wrong? So whenever an API call happens to serverless workloads, there were also issues related to call latency. So for people who are not aware of it, when an API call happens, it does take five to 10 seconds for your managed server to start up and start responding to the API call that you make. And because of that call latency, directly your cost also gets impacted. For the debugging limitations, we do have debugging features and serverless workloads. Of course, you can see your application logs, but when it comes to infra, you have not much enough insights, and that was also a big problem for us to really understand what was going wrong with the applications. You also have a dependency of all the runtime versions that you use within your workloads. Let's say you're having a Java workload or Python or any such, the version, runtime version is fully controlled by the cloud providers, so you cannot update to the new features that's been released. If there is any new version that's released today, you have to wait until the cloud provider makes it generally available. So that was also another problem that we faced. And the execution time limits is something very specific to serverless workloads for Azure. I'm not sure about other cloud providers. If you are using a consumption plan, there is a five minutes of limitation which you cannot exceed when you're using your serverless workloads. Maintenance efforts and costs, the main reason being we also had VM-based workloads and we also have serverless workloads. We had to maintain both the infras as well as different pipelines, deployment of applications, so it was too much of cost for us. I would leave from here to my colleague Soumya to continue the rest of the session. Thanks. Uh, am I audible, by the way? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's nice. So, yeah, this is me. I was not actually supposed to uh, giving the session, so uh, please pardon me if I'm not uh, that well prepared. But, uh, yeah, so I am a solution architect right now in ABN AMRO. That's my official title over there. But uh, what, uh, what I am is a developer and a an, uh, Kubernetes enthusiast like uh, most of you over here. So, uh, yeah, that's, I think, enough about, about me. I l live in Utrecht, that's why it, uh, it was like the most easiest for uh, someone to come here to give the presentation from the, since uh, my colleague dropped out. But, okay, going into the benefits of AKS. Um, I think I'm, not, I'm gonna skip the benefits of Kubernetes altogether because that's the whole reason why I think everyone is here. For, but uh, why Azure? Why Azure Kubernetes service and not any, any other? Well, because AVN has Azure and uh, we have Azure at our uh, disposal. Well, uh, it also take, uh, is easy for us to de deploy or get a Kubernetes instance very easily for us, uh, which is usable and has all the, uh, and has the platform team, has uh, uh, every policy and everything placed beforehand. So we don't have to be, uh, maintain the uh, uh, maintain too much in that sense because uh, deploying and maintaining a Kubernetes cluster, you will need a, a separate platform team and all those things, which we do not want. And well, uh, based on uh, what the company actually needs uh, in terms of speed, 
we wanted the application deployed or used yesterday, right? That's uh, mainly the reason why we prefer going into uh, clouds, uh, cloud providers who actually uh, can give us a Kubernetes instance. Now, the, uh, there are uh, some other uh, more uh, basic uh, things of uh, like benefits like resource utilization. We can uh, limit the resource utilization. We can uh, optimize that at most. Then we have service discovery and uh, orchestration, which also comes as part of AKS. Like uh, you can also, uh, you probably also know about service mesh, I think mostly. How many people have worked here with service mesh? Okay. Just still uh, a lot of people, but yeah, these all come out of the box, security compliance, and also reduce complexity with regards to implementing, but yeah, I would not say reduce com uh, complexity that much because, well, uh, Kubernetes in, in, in and of itself is a very complex service when not, uh, not many people in your organization or in your team will be like proficient in Kubernetes, I'm assuming. These are like the common challenges, just as what we were saying. So there are a lot of things that, that are written over here, and I think the slides will probably be shared to everyone. So uh, I'm not going through everything, but I will uh, talk about the picture that you're seeing over here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, when people say we are moving into containerized solutions or like moving into, uh, into the cloud native solution, that's where we start. Okay, let's start learning container. And then I think we are done, right? Now, where do you host those container? Like, you can just host them in a normal uh, VM or like uh, there are past solutions that you can uh, use, right? But uh, yeah, but how, to, how do you build those uh, in a CI CD manner? So you learn Docker then. Next, then, okay, we, are, uh, we don't want to use uh, past solution, we want to use uh, Kubernetes solution. And then start with the Kubernetes. Then, yeah, we are done. And then we see, oh shit. That's uh, something that I've seen uh, with the team because uh, I, the team that we are having, most of them were very much afraid of moving into Kubernetes. And the biggest reason is they think of it as a big black box, like it will be a big uh, issue for us to learn or a new thing that we have to learn, which is why everyone is like pretty scared of using it. But also some people in the team actually uh, said like, yeah, it's a magic solution. We can just uh, uh, use, start using Kubernetes, everything will be solved. Well, no, everything does not get solved. <laughs> it, it, you just start uh, uh, having problems from thereafter. So we did have some challenges when uh, setting, uh, setting things up for Kubernetes, and that is mostly because it's an enterprise level uh, solution, right? Now, the biggest challenge that we had were uh, of networking. Because uh, when you are uh, in a big organization, you have enterprise level networking, which is like connected with your uh, on-premise uh, systems and uh, with your entire uh, enterprise network. And there are limited number of IPs. And uh, because it's a, a bank or uh, because it's an enterprise, there are a lot of restrictions that uh, you need to follow and a lot of approval processes. And you know it's very slow. So. We, uh, how do we increase agility in that? Those things were some challenges that we have faced, and mostly that's related to Azure CNI. How many of you are uh, like uh, familiar with Azure? Okay, nice. Uh, how many of you know about Azure CNI? Okay, nice. That's uh, really nice. So I uh, don't have to explain it. Now I, I'll explain just a bit. So the main limitation of Azure CNI is like every pod will have one IP. Now, I'm not going into the CNI overlay on all those things, but because of that limitations, we uh, the subnets that we are getting assigned from our network team will run out uh, run out of IP very soon as soon as we start scaling. So that's like the biggest limitation that we had when uh, when we were migrating to this. So. Uh, uh, there were other things as well, like uh, des uh, designing a whole Kubernetes deployment process and tools associated with them, because like you you are going into a mi more mi more microservice architecture. That's why you are moving into Kubernetes. But the main problem that comes with that is that you well there are multiple different packages that need to be maintained properly. Otherwise, then you don't have any Kubernetes application to begin with, right? 
That's why like uh, the de uh, des uh, design and build deployment process is one of the challenges that you have when you are starting off with Kubernetes. And well, because we are like an agile organization, right? We want more faster deployment, faster development, right? So if we don't have maintainability, uh, uh, then it doesn't make any sense. And at this point, I'm actually quoting one of my colleagues who said this when we started having this discussion is, uh, nail it before you scale it. That's like the best, uh, uh, best uh, line that I heard <laughs> during that discussion because we had to kind of make everything available before we can actually ask people to start using it on a large scale basis. But if we make something, bef uh, make something and then deliver to the customer, the customer is not gonna wait for it, right? We need to f uh, make it and get their feedback at the same time. So going into those things, what our migration tactics were. So we had to design for high availability because we, uh, no, because you know VMs and all those things, we had a lot of problems, which uh, Raji already talked about. Now, then we needed lesser deployment time because we want uh, faster scalability. We want faster, ev well, faster everything basically. And then we needed automated rollouts and rollbacks because if something, some small uh, issue goes into production, we want instant rollback to the previous version. So GitOps and all those uh, methods we also need to implement at the same time. Now, all of these things we had to keep in mind before we can move on to actually implementing it. Now, we needed to follow some steps. And the, the, the biggest challenge that we, uh, we would have while following that step is to maintain two things at the same time. Because we can't decommission an existing system just like that and start with the new system, right? We had to maintain two different systems and slowly phase out parts and uh, parts by part of uh, those systems, which is like the point you can see in the very middle that is like run both versions in parallel, which is canary. And uh, we had to build new components, one, one, one after the other. We had to retire old components, segregate co uh, components based on the critical, uh, criticality of it. And because, well, again, we are working in an agile organization, right? So we had to uh, uh, well, plan, and, uh, plan shorter and uh, simpler features, which goes all the way into production so that we can get feedback from our customers. So that was the migration steps that we had to take. And this is how the new uh, stack looks like. Means we, we have uh, Docker for uh, building our images. We have Q AKS. We have uh, storage accounts for uh, the uh, persistent volumes. Then we have um, event hubs. And then we have package managers uh, like Helm. And also for the de de development, uh, sorry, deployment, we are using Terraform. Okay. Okay. Now, from all the way back, I'll go to the old implementation, which was this, which had a lot of VMs and not utilizing uh, most of the things in a VM when we are actually having one application on it, to all the way into this where we had a managed Kubernetes instance with 12 nodes, and also the event hubs, I will come to that later. So we, ha we made a hybrid cloud native and pass solution, which is using event hubs and Azure Kubernetes in the mid uh, as the center. So most of our applications are, uh, were containerized and uh, uh, orchestrated using Kubernetes. And those applications mostly were uh, the function apps that uh, Raji talked about before, the 20 plus function apps. Actually, it, it was more, right, Raji? Tw not 20 plus, yeah. So, yeah. So those applications were actually uh, what we were, uh, yeah, we were migrating into Kubernetes, and the event hubs are mo mostly for the streaming of data. So. Our main uh, use case was to stream huge amounts of data from different uh, different uh, on-premise applications and VMs into the, our uh, uh, into our system, uh, which was into our application for uh, analysis and uh, security. So, 
for doing that, we had like huge numbers of VMs, right? Uh, 50 plus VMs because whenever there is a new workload, we added a VM. That was the old old school method of doing things, but that took a long time. That was not scalable, not actually at all uh, possible. So that's why we moved into event hubs and streaming because it's a pass solution. It has it has its own drawbacks. I I I do admit, but yeah, without going into that. Uh, the event hubs provided us with streaming options that can have uh, that, that can be uh, that we can pull data from multiple different uh, on-premise data centers, and then we have we put all those data and use Kubernetes to scale and uh, process all those data that were coming in. So the new uh, stack stats from compared to the old one. Sorry, we have to go. We have to go all the way back. Yes. 50 plus VMs, 10 load balance, uh, 10 plus load balancers, 20 function apps, more logic apps, and bicep templates. Now we only have one AKS cluster, some somewhere around 1,000 pods, but uh, yeah, that's the pod count because it's scalable and uh, the applications are like reusable. And then we have uh, about two TB of events that are getting ingested per day, and we have. Two event hub namespace. I think it's three, right, uh, Rachi? Or, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. So that's the whole uh, architecture right now over here that we have, and we have migrated from the VMs into this. Okay. Nice. That was, I think, all that I wanted to speak about. I am assuming people have questions. No. Oh, okay. 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 Um, what what you see is um, usually when uh, you don't have a lot of VMs, the mm -hmm. cloud is going to get very expensive. And you move everything to Kubernetes cluster. Did you notice any uh, cost savings at the end? That's uh, actually a good question, and uh, we did notice a lot of cost savings because. Uh, when we uh, when talking about VMs, you also have to uh, think about the maintenance of those VMs, and there were people who who were maintaining them because patching and all those things and uh, specific uh, VMs had specific problems. So that also added uh, as the cost. The VMs in itself are very expensive, especially if they are Azure VMs and you have to uh, have like huge uh, load to actually uh, have data streaming enabled. So. Yeah, there, it was a lot, and the uh, cost is uh, cost savings uh, perspective. It is quite a lot because now you can uh, with the Kubernetes and uh, Event Hub, so you don't have uh, you are getting a pass solution out of the box. You get data flowing through, so it uh, it reduces the the cost of uh, multiple VMs, and also you have uh, pods specific to your purpose, so you you can make your application as lightweight as possible. So. It will save a lot of cost. I think it. Uh, yeah, the answer was a little long, but uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. We now have a 30 minutes break until the next talk. So, yeah, grab a snack or something.